Hello everyone uh, and good morning. Uh, welcome back to uh, English Poetry at the Islamic University of Gaza. We continue uh, to speak about John Donne. Uh, last time we had a short and brief uh, uh, class on John Donne's poem, parody poem, uh, The Bait. Today we continue to speak about this very, very significant literary poetic movement in, uh, in history spearheaded and led by John Donne. Now, before I give you, uh, give you some uh, information about uh, John Donne himself or his movement and how, uh, how he kind of, how he wrote poetry, how different his poetry, uh, poetry was, I want to say something about uh, the, uh, the neoclassical movement of that time. When we speak about classical literature, we speak about ancient Greece, ancient Rome. Uh, we speak about the giants, the, 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 like Homer, for example, with the uh, Odyssey and the Iliad. Uh, the text that many, many people consider to be the greatest of all times because of so many things. Now, later on in time, about 2,000 years ago, uh, there was some kind of decline in poetry. Poetry was not as great as it should be, as it was before. And many critics, uh, one of them is named Horace, who was a teacher, a critic, and also a poet, wanted to, you know, to push his people, his society, to educate his society, the poets of his time, and teach them how to write great poetry. The answer was simple. If you want to write great poetry, you need to imitate great poets. If you want to write great poetry, all you have to do is just copycat the great uh, uh, poets. And for this, he examined, all, all, like many great texts, tragedies and epics, long poems. And he came with three things under the uh, rules of decorum. I just want to summarize them in these three important uh, points. We call them the rules of decorum. And decorum is from decor, yeah? Internal decor, external decor. From decorate, to make something more beautiful, more appropriate, to make things more attractive, perhaps, more appealing. Now, number one, he said, if you need to write poetry, you need to choose your topic, your subject carefully, the subject matter. What you write about has to be of great significance. You need to write about great truths, about things that touch the society as a whole, about important themes. And then, if you want to write about important themes, necessarily you need to use what we might describe as the poetic diction. Diction, dictionary, diction means language. You need to use a sublime language, highly embellished language, a language that can convey the greatness and the significance of this subject matter. And then the forms you need to adopt in order to differentiate poetry from other kinds of writings, right. you need to write adopting certain forms, forms that have, you know, rules also with uh, certain structures, the number of lines, the number of syllables, the number of feet, the way the, the lines should rhyme or shouldn't. Now, many other things, but basically these are the three things I am interested in. So, subject matter, like what, for example? Like, you, you write poetry about great battles, about epics, about heroes, about kings, about queens, about the gods, about myths, about king and the queen. Things that, again, touch the society as a whole, of great significance to the whole society. You don't write about trivial things, insignificant things. These things should not be in poetry. Because, again, poetry is meant, basically, and this, again, you studied this with Aristotle and other critics, how poetry, how literature is meant to teach and delight. 
what are you going to teach me if you're writing a poem about, I don't know, your, your lucky pen or your lucky pencil or your most favorite piece of pizza, your, most, uh, your, your cat mewing and waking you up in the middle of the night. This is not of great significance to, to many people. So this is not uh, you know, a topic fit enough for poetry, worthy enough of poetry. You write about it, I don't know, you, you use comedy, you use prose, you just tell people the story of this insignificant topic you want to, ta to talk about, right? but don't use poetry, because poetry is great, is meant for great things, for significant things. So subject matters have to be elite, sublime. And again, the language, not, this means that not every word, every expression can make it to language. Conversational language, colloquial language, slang, not poetry. Cannot be poetic. You need to choose your words and to word your words carefully. In a way that is different from ordinary speech, from conversational speech. In a way that you, uh, again, you touch people. You, you show people that you're, you're not an ordinary uh, person. You're not writing ordinary stuff. If this is a very significant topic, I'm using a very significant, a highly embellished, a refined language. I like to use the word refined to, to describe how ridiculous this is sometimes. A refined language. You know, when they do petrol and the gas and stuff, there is a refinery, you know, refineries in Iraq and Saudi Arabia to refine things. It, because you need, you need to make things decorous, beautiful, attractive, to achieve the sublime. So not every word, not every phrase, not every kind of language can make it to poetry or should make it to poetry because there is something that is unpoetic in language. And again, again, that there's the greatness here, greatness in, in the theme, in the topic, in the subject matter, greatness in, in the medium, in the means, in the language itself. Now you have to put this in the most beautiful form there is most highly, again, I would say, uh, uh, highly structured, like we spoke, for example, I, I like to give the, the, uh, the sonnet as an example of how the, you can achieve this. Everything is calculated. Everything, is, everything counts, remember? The number of lines, the number of syllables, the, the, way, the way you rhyme. Now, in England, in the 16th century, many people adopted this. And in the 17th century, probably the, the 17th century was the, the hay, the, the, we call this in England, if this is classicism, you know, 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, what happened in England is usually described as neoclassicism or neoclassicism. Classical al hadith jadida, or whatever. Because people wanted to, again, in England, again, they asked the question, how can we write great poetry? And there was this inferiority complex in England. They always wanted to compete. They always wanted to be better. But ironically, instead of creating their own forms, again, they ended up imitating Italian and not only Italian, but also ancient Roman and Greek forms of, of literature. Uh, 17th century, and even in the 18th century, this was the norm. Like, we talk about 300 years of people uh, believing in uh, the right way. There was the right way and the wrong way. Not only that, many people believe that this could exclude some poets. If you, if you don't follow the rules, if you don't try to choose your subjects carefully, if you don't use the language that ought to be used or you fit them in the form, you can be banished. You can be banished. You will not be considered a poet. Interesting. Now, in Arabic, we have the same thing, by the way. In Arabic, we have the same thing. Look at the old classical Arabic poetry. Almost 2,000 years of writing poetry in the very same way. Very strict rules. Change was almost impossible. And sadly, in our traditions, many people try to connect the, um, the, the poetry, the classical Arabic poetry, with the Quran and the Hadith. So if everybody tried to change something about the poetry, ah. Uh, what are you trying to do? Are you trying, you know, trying to say something about the Quran and the Hadith, trying to change them in a way? This is sad, 
That's why many Arab poets, by the way, were banished just because they wanted to write different poetry. They wanted to change. And only recently, some of those poets, and we t again, we talk about Nazik uh, al-Malaika, Badr Jakr al-Sayyab. We talk about like 70 years ago. And when, when, when khalas, poets said, enough. With all due respect to classical Arabic poetry, we need to change. There are other forms out there. Language is now different. Life is now different. So why, why don't we adapt? Why don't we change? And even like for decades and decades, those poets by many conservative uh, critics were not considered serious poets. Sharul Horf reverse and this thing and uh, many people did not even at universities only recently some universities started to take uh, Badr Shakir Sayyab and Nazik Al Kafarna and even poets like Ahmad Mada to take them seriously and this is interesting now the same thing happened in England but a lot earlier when people were writing if I want I don't know how I could describe the timeline of neoclassicism if we talk about the 16th century, and then the 17th century, 16th century, late 16th century, early 17th century, where John Donne was writing, and then uh, 17th century and 18th century, and then we go to the Romantic uh, movement. If you want to write, I don't know, the stupid timeline. John Donne was here, basically. But I'm talking about this whole period here. So when John Donne came, if you look at, uh, probably I, I noted this last time, John Donne is a contemporary of Shakespeare and probably a contemporary of uh, Marlowe and, and, and Ben Johnson. But he's not classified as any of those people. He's not classified. We describe him as an as a Elizabethan, uh, Jacobian, like many things, because he lived during many, many reigns. Okay. Now, I would say... Uh, during the heyday of neoclassicism, when English poets believed wholeheartedly in these rules of decorum, that if you wanted to write poetry, you need to follow these rules. Someone said, no, no, -uh. not doing it. And this man is John Donne. He refused this, and we'll see today, probably also next class, we'll talk about what he did and how he did what he did. Now, most of what I'm going to say is, is my interpretations reading John Donne's uh, poems. He did not write a book of criticism. He did not write an article of criticism uh, suggesting to people what to do or condemning and criticizing uh, the, the mainstream uh, rules of versification. And I'll try to make my point and it's up to you to uh, to believe whatever you want to believe. Now, John Donne, number one, believed that there's no such thing as the subject matter. It's wrong. Anything, anybody can make it to a poem. Why would poetry, because by the way, if we talk about poetry in this way, I believe it makes poetry an elite practice. An elitist practice, practice meaning Poetry is only for the rich. Poetry is only for the king, for the queen, for the nobility, for the royal family, for people who go to Oxford, to Cambridge, for the educated, for people who learn Latin. It means poetry is not for the many, it's for the few, for the 1% rather than for the 99%. And I think Bernie Sanders would be proud of John Donne, you know. And this is not, if, if, because the literature is meant to be for all. Now drama, look at this, how this elitist idea of literature, if we make literature elitist, it destroys literature. If we make literature for just some group, that's not good. If you look at drama, you're studying drama. Drama is for all. Look at Shakespeare and the Globe. The, the irony is that the rich people wanted to pay money to stay farther away from the stage. Where the poor people paid just pennies and they were like standing this close to, to the actors on the stage. Sometimes pulling their clothes, you know, throwing stuff at them, insulting them, making fun of them, laughing at them, feeding them things to say, you know. 
And people, I'm sure people up above were like, what the hell are those people doing? They're spoiling the fun for us. We've come here to enjoy, you know, Hamlet or Macbeth or whatever, and those people are just keep, you know, they crack jokes. And I would find this very interesting how the, this is, it's like a kind of festival where everybody has to be there, where this is the only place where the poor people can send messages to the people above. And for this, the rich people said, okay, we need to find a way out. And they kind of made up, created the masks, you know the masks, the, ma the plays that were specifically written for the king or the, the palace, specifically performed for those people, performed once, and even the actors were fa mostly family members from the elite, from the family members and everything, because they wanted things to be only for them. Now, poetry for a lot of time was something like this. Well, of course, I never talk in generalities. You will find many other things, but it was, and uh, sorry for, again, this, another digression. Many people believe Shakespeare is not Shakespeare because of this elitist belief that you have to be an Oxford or Cambridge graduate in order to write what Shakespeare wrote. People who say Shakespeare is not Shakespeare, you know, there are many reasons, but one of these reasons is that people believe, some people believe it's impossible for someone who just went to a grammar school like Shakespeare to write these great masterpieces. So this idea is also itself elitist. That if you are a poor man, if you didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge, you can't write something like this. It's impossible for you to write something like this. And this is interesting how to, to look at things. Because sadly, and we'll see this in a bit, sadly, and unfortunately, we usually take critics for granted. Ben Johnson says something, oh, he must be right. Aristotle says something, oh, he must be right. Dryden, one of the greatest critics and poets, he must be right, he's Dryden. Who am I to question Dryden? And this is wrong, because there will always be frames and constructs imposed upon us. We need to break them, to unframe uh, this. Now, subject, anything can be in a subject matter. Look at John Donne's poem, The Flea, you know, the disgusting little creature that keeps jumping and sucking blood. The bait, and look at the, 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 the scenery, the setting, and everything. We'll see how what he does to the, to the sonnet, the most sacred form of all, of all of, uh, forms. Huh. And then anything can make it to, you will find in John Donne uh, words, expressions that can't be found anywhere in any uh, poem. The way he starts the poem, the way he elaborates on the conceits, the long, you know, metaphors the language he uses, and that's why, and this is again sad, we'll talk about this in a bit, some people describe John Donne as vulgar. Why are you talking to God like this? Ravish me, batter my heart, why are you give, giving orders to God? That's vulgar of you, look at Sophia. But I don't think it's true, I don't think he's vulgar. He's using the language of the masses, rather than the language of the elite. He's trying to avoid using an embellished language, sometimes a dead language. He's trying to appeal to the masses rather than the to the elite. And this, for many people, is not good. Okay? We'll see and give examples. And then the forms, the rules, especially how many syllables you should have, how many, and the rhyme scheme and everything. John, but don't get this wrong. Jonathan would follow these rules, basically. But if the rule hinders the meaning, the emotions, the feelings, he will break the rule. That's simple. And if most of the poems, I could sh show you a thousand poems from the time of John Donne, before him and after him, during him. And then you'll find that the, the, they look like boxes, you know? It's the same. We've seen with Shakespeare's sonnets. Thousands of lines, all, almost all of them, 10 syllables, five feet. With John Donne, he could sometimes do a variety of things. Five feet, four feet, six feet, three feet, two feet. Because he believes that the meaning, the thought, the idea, the experience is more significant than, than the rule. If the rule restricts and limits the, the, his, his, you know, the release of emotions, his expression, he would break the rule. So here, sadly, 
Again, no disrespect to classical poetry at all. Don't get me wrong. When we talk about the rules of decorum, sometimes we talk about a given form. Some kind, like, like templates. If you want to write a sonnet, here you go. Shakespeare, here you go. You know, quatrain, 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 couplet, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Yalla, fill it, fill it in. Throw the words in, in, in there. Make your poem. But this is your lane. Don't go here, don't go there. For John Donne, the meaning comes, always comes over the rule. Here, neoclassicism, rules of decorum, rules come first. Rules come first. Rules come first. And for John Donne, no. So in my understanding, I believe that it, the first serious attempt to bring poetry from the, the, you know, the ivory tower, you know ivory tower, the highest, put the peak, you know, the castles, the king, you know, the rich people, the elite, changing poetry from being an elitist practice, bringing it down to us, the poor people, the downtrodden, the oppressed, the ordinary people, the masses, the 99% was John Donne. So I think John Donne, I could safely say this personally, I believe in this, that John Donne brought poetry down to earth. John Donne brought it from the castles, from the palaces, from the courts down to us, to you, to me, to the masses, by making it appeal to our experiences, to our languages and and everything, the way we speak, the way we think. And this is a very, very serious thing to do. In my understanding, in my reading of John Donne, he is the first real uh, modernist in English poetry. When you read a uh, box about poetry, literary box and criticism, when people when critics speak about uh, romanticism, they say this is the first real uh, modernist move, movement. It's true. But John Donne, a hundred years, like more than a hundred years before them, he was engaged in the same thing. Writing against the current, breaking the rules of the mainstream, rules of falsification, uh, rejecting the given forms of, uh, of poetry, refusing the elite, highly embellished language of, uh, of poetry, saying everybody can be a poet, everything can be in poetry, every language can be in poetry, every experience is worthy to be in, 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 in poetic forms. Okay? Now, if you have questions, please. If you have anything, any, any suggestion, anything, please. I have a question. Um, if Horace, as a teacher of poetry uh, in the Greek uh, era, told He's people a Roman poet and critic. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, in, in, he gave rules, rules to people to write about the, about the subject, the poetic diction, mm -hmm. and the form. So for you as a, a poet uh, and a teacher at this time, and you write poetry, what is uh, like the uh, summarized uh, or the small definition of poetry for the people who want to write what they do? Now, okay, for those, my, in, my, in my way, it's good to understand all of this. And this is what I'm doing, I'm trying to understand how people do. And then when you write poetry, you just write poetry. I don't believe in given forms, okay? Here, the definition of poetry is, uh, uh, Poetry, in Arabic it's again similar. In Arabic it's similar. Something with uh, strict music and strict rhyme scheme. Look at this. The music, the rhythm, and the rhyme come before the meaning. Rules, rules, meaning. Okay? There is one, one objective here, or two objectives, to teach and delight, to educate and to please. So in, 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 my, in my understanding, my way of doing things, my philosophy, poetry should not have, uh, it's good to follow the rules, but if you can't, again, we are not native speakers, for example. If I, want you, if I ask you to write sonnets and nothing but sonnets, you will fail and you will fail miserably. And again, this is one reason, in my understanding, that many people wanted us to follow the rules, so that we fail and fail miserably. I was reading this piece of information, I think I didn't, go after it, but it's mind-blowing. Somebody was saying, he, he used, what's that French word? Rendezvous, something like this. He wrote that on Twitter and said, uh, 
Not one letter in this word is pronounced as it is written. And in the reply, someone was saying, this was deliberate in French, because the elite did not want the masses to understand how to write, how to spell, and how to read. So we, we have this, always. The class division and how the rich people wanted to be different, wanted to not only to be different, but also to tread on the lower classes. It happens, it's happening, it, hap it has been happening since the, you know. So if you have the feeling, the urge to release some kind of experience in, in a form you consider poetry, just write it down. This could be extreme, but for many, for many people they would object to me saying this. Please. Now, uh, one more question. Uh, yeah. C can we say that uh, John Donne uh, make like a, 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 he was a revolutionary, a revolutionary uh, uh, poet or uh, like attack the other the mainstream poets uh, implicitly or, or or they know that he attacks them, them or what? Uh, okay. There is a, uh, again a big debate here. Uh, was John Donne just a mere digression? Was he just a digression? Was he just, you know, this, this uh, idiom in English, a fluke, somebody who just throw the front and that's it. I believe John Donne was conscious, was deliberately trying to subvert and undermine the mainstream uh, critics and poets. And when we um, uh, mention, and we're going to do this again, the come live with me and be my love bit, there's clear intention He's quoting somebody, he's dragging Marlowe and his courtly, uh, uh, courtly love, you know, the idealistic Elizabethan way of writing poetry. Dragging him and saying, hey, nobody has all the pleasures. Mine are new. I could take this metaphorically to mean his new ways of writing poetry. The way, the sensibility, the new sensibility. So I think, yeah, John Donne implicitly and explicitly he attacked those people, the, the, the neoclassicists. But again, so for some people it's not that explicit. And remember, he didn't write, this one problem with John Donne and his school is that they didn't write like essays or books to tell the people like the Romantics did, to define poetry and to say, hey, poetry, enough. We should write poetry in this way. And the other problem is that John Donne was writing in the heyday of, of neoclassicism. The romantics were writing here. When there was you know, a decline, people have had enough of neoclassical poetry and they wanted to change. And even then, some of those romantics were not famous during their life, lifetimes. Life is crazy. And we'll see, one critic will see how, what critic said this. Uh, ben, ben Johnson said John Donne will perish. He will die out. He will be forgotten. Nobody will remember him for breaking the rules. And now we're talking about John Donne. He's one of the most significant English poets. And we don't talk, with, again, with all due respect to John, uh, Ben Johnson or not. We don't talk about him that much. Please. I, I just want to say that what I truly love about John Donne is that he didn't only try to subvert or, let's say, to challenge humans only, uh, or his society, I think that he had enough of life as a whole, like for example, in his, uh, in his poem about death, mm, yeah. he was challenging death itself, so yeah. I think that he was done with life as a whole, and this is why he was hmm. trying to, to uh, challenge everything. Like John Donne had, had a, a very tough life, we'll talk about this in a bit, his and life was not that long. easy. But you could, and that's the beautiful thing about, about Dunn. This is why I like Dunn as much as I like Shakespeare. There are always layers for his uh, poetry. Uh, Come live with me and be my love, the bait, it's a, it's a love poem with sensuality and the sexuality there in the poem. But it's also a religious poem. If you read it as a religious poem, it's also mind-blowing. So death be not proud. Is he just, this is a religious poem, clearly. Can I take it as somebody, like you said, defying and challenging authority? Perhaps. Yeah. Perhaps. I know that like, you didn't, love, uh, you didn't uh, encourage us to read about the life of poets before, like analyzing poems. But like an interesting thing that I found about John Donne that he was like an he was a Catholic when everyone was angry. True. So that made it made life even more difficult for him. That's true. He didn't even graduate. Like he studied in Cambridge and Oxford, but like he didn't <coughs> a degree at 
the That's true. Of, because he was also busy. That's true. So that also influenced him. Of course. Yeah. There's a lot of his life in his poetry. But my way is that let's see the te- what the text says and then go back to his life rather than the other way around. And that's why uh, Ben Johnson himself, who was a contemporary of John Donne, said John Donne deserves hanging for breaking the rules, for breaking the accents of poetry. Deserves hanging. Like you could, if you are, you come mid-story, somebody saying, yeah, he deserves hanging. Oh, oh my God, what did he do? Who did he kill? Whose piece of pizza did he eat? You know, serious offenses. But he just broke the rules of decorum. He didn't, you know, write like we write. He didn't compose both the way we are accustomed to composing. They're like, what? And then going back to this, like many people say, no, he meant it metaphorically. No, it was, a, in my opinion, my understanding, this is a serious threat against John Donne's life. John Donne John Dunn had some family members killed for being Catholic. Can you imagine that? His cousin, his uncle, I think his uncle, his uncle was killed because he was a Catholic. He was originally born a Catholic, and then later on he had, for practical or pragmatic reasons, he had to convert to the new Church of England. So when you come to somebody who was originally a Catholic, at a time when Catholics were persecuted and killed, not only for being Catholics, or people were killed because they were harboring and hiding Catholics in their homes. And then you tell, hey, you deserve hanging. No. This is a serious threat. Now why? Because people are extreme. We, when we love something, we want everybody to follow and respect it. And then we also, sometimes there are personal gains and personal interests. I'm not saying that these critics were doing stuff for money, but money could have played part in this because they were patrons. Patrons were people who would give you social and political protection and give you money to write them poetry. If there is a new poet in time doing poetry differently, writing different poetry, he might attract so many of these patrons just which might influence them, but it, it, like mostly I believe that they believe that this is religion. This is the way poetry has to be written. Okay, so when John Donne did this, he was rejected altogether. No negotiation, no nothing. His contemporaries, and later on we talk about Dryden, we talk about Samuel Johnson, we talk about Alexander Pope, all together, all those giants of the neoclassical movement, they rejected John Donne, and they did even more than that. They negatively framed him. You know, the term framing, I love this term. Framing, to frame somebody, to talk about him or her in a way that would change people's, you know, perceptions uh, negatively and po- or positively. So, Ben Johnson said, that's, we'll count the things. Ben Johnson said, John Donne deserves hanging. John Donne will perish. The most interesting thing, reaction to John Donne was by, by, by John Dryden. John Dryden said, Donne affects the metaphysics. He affects the metaphysics, whatever that means. John Donne perplexes the minds of the fair sex. John Donne confuses women. John Donne is too difficult for women to understand. And the interesting thing is that, again, Dryden, like most of those patriarchal figures, appointed himself as the spokesperson for, for women. And assumed that women will not be, a, despite the fact that history says, the graphical information, that John Donne was mainly writing for, uh, for women. And I think two of his patrons were, patrons were women. So he was sending these, some of these poems to women. So when you say, when you come and say, okay, John Donne, uh, I'm sorry, your, your poetry is, is difficult. Oh, Dryden, you're not un- you, you don't understand my poetry. No, 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 not me. Women don't understand your poetry. And, you know, and this in itself, like uh, indicating that John Donne might be, uh, could be uh, an anti-feminist poet. This remark itself is not only anti-feminist, it's misogynistic also. <laughs> it hates women. It assumes women to be less intellectual. Dryden, 
Dryden, yeah, like Dryden's uh, remark is anti-feminist in itself. Dryden saying that John Donne confuses women is too difficult for women is anti-feminist and misogynistic. Because he assumes that, again, that women are not smart enough. Now, we we'll see other critics reacting. Uh, 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 I'll go through the, the list uh, now. Like Samuel Johnson <coughs> describes John Donne in, in, a, in, a, in a very also negative way. And he gives him, gives him and his followers the name metaphysical poets. Metaphysical poets and metaphysical poetry. And until this very day, we know them as the metaphysical poets. Now, what does it mean? What is metaphysical? Don't raise your hand because it means nothing. It's crap. Imagine your most, the, the, like your, you know, an arch enemy giving you a nickname. Is she going to be generous about that? Is she going to, to say good, good stuff about yourself? And be careful, most, most of those poets and movements were not named, like they didn't name themselves, they didn't give themselves the name we use now. Even the romantics, like later critics said, okay, these are the romantic poets. The theater of the absurd. Samuel Beckett didn't say, okay, I, I write absurd stuff. Other critics, and usually critics who don't like you would give you the name like what happened with John Donne. So in my opinion, Metaphysical, okay, if metaphysical, some people try to compromise. If metaphysical means, you know, intellectual, I would take it. Argumentative, I would take it. But it was used as a term, as T.S. Eliot himself says, it was used as a term of abuse, yes. as an insult, as a way to drive people away from those people, from those poets. Metaphysical poetry. So if you want to define meta means this, and physical means this, and beyond nature, don't do that. The term itself, the word itself, means nothing. Because it was given by the, the enemies, let me say, of the metaphysical poets. So today we use this as a term of convenience. Halas, everybody knows that these are the, the, the romantics. Although sometimes I insist on calling them John Donne School. John Donne uh, School of, or Movement, School of Poetry. Okay, we'll see uh, two, uh, two poems. We mentioned one last time. We'll go through it again and see another a poem by, uh, uh, by John Donne and how this changed in, in many ways. Do you have any question before we go through this again? I'll, I'll be posting this under the videos on YouTube so you can use them. Okay, so if, if, if you want me to uh, uh, wrap things up, this, these are the rules of decorum very old rules to examine what is proper and what is appropriate to be in poetry or not to be in poetry. This was meant to guide people. If you want to write great literature, follow, imitate, copy, create poets. Poetry had two aims, to teach and delight, to please and, and to educate. Now again, that subject matter had to be sublime and elite. Talking about issues like great, uh, issues of great significance to the whole society, like the gods, the battles, heroes, the kings and the queens. There should always be things related, like in the themes, related to universal truths. Something to transcend sometimes the barriers of time and etc. To achieve decorum, mixture of forms should not happen. You don't mix tragedy and comedy. You don't do that. Comedy is comedy, tragedy is tragedy. This is basically in tragedy, not poetry, but poetry. Tra drama is poetry also. Okay? Now the diction has to be highly embellished, refined, and sophisticated. Something called poetic diction. The descriptions themselves are supposed to be pleasant, delicate, flowery, idyllic, you know? sweet, romantic, like we saw with Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day, we saw in Marlowe's Come Live With Me and Be My Love, the scenery, the beauty, life, the utopia-like setting. Poetry has to be expressed in words or phrases that are not in ordinary conversation, but in what is known as the poetic 
language, the language of poetry. The same thing again with the rules of decorum uh, that dictate uh, uh, the poem has to use a regular form, a highly structured form. The shape, the lines, the, even the, the syllables, everything has to be highly uh, calculated. I give here uh, the sonnet as an example, uh, being the epitome of, of decorum. Now, John Donne is a modernist. A modernist is somebody who writes against the mainstream, the traditions, who wants to break the rules, to bring something new. And a modernist is not something that happened in the 20, 20th century or 21st century. It's anybody who wrote differently. Why? Because John Donne believed these rules were limiting, were restricting. And many of those, uh, uh, many, many critics later on believed in the same way, like the Romantics. These rules were limiting. We'll mention this again with the Romantics. I believe that these rules make poetry elitist for the educated, for people who go to university and learn about ancient literature and uh, ancient languages and the rules of poetry writing. Therefore, uh, we'll see how poetry, for example, you, uh, employs parody and satire and uses uh, intertextuality as a means to subvert and undermine and challenge and defy, like Noah said, the, the given well-established forms of uh, uh, not only poetry but also social construct, like I say here, the attack against these rules was also against the social and poetic mainstream constructs of, of everything, of women, of poets, of who, of land, of everything. And that is serious. That is why people would hate uh, poets like John Donne and those who break the rules. Because this is not only about poetry, it's about the whole world view. We are living, remember the, uh, the uh, uh, the chain of being, you know, this chain of being with God being here, the king and everything. This was thought to be God-given. Any change in this order means destroying the whole world, creating chaos. And that was not allowed uh, to be. Now, John Donne, these are interesting things people said about John Donne. Again, Ben Johnson saying, for not being understood, John Donne will perish. Number one, he will not be understood, and therefore he will die out. He will be forgotten. And Sorry, Ben Johnson. John Donne, yeah. he passed away. Because, uh, and that, for not keeping the accent, the accent, the music, the rules, whatever it means, exactly. Rhythm. Not the accent, the language, like the music, the poetry, the rhythm. He deserved hanging. That's very extreme, huh? And then John Dryden John says, John Donne affects the metaphysics. He perplexes the minds of the fair sex, that's women, you know, trying to be cute, with nice speculations of philosophy when he should engage hearts. Look at how this, I, I, I call this the how to do manual, what to do in poetry. If you want to write poetry to women, you have to address their hearts, to entertain their softness, the softness of love, something John Donne disagrees with. Samuel Johnson says, Dan's poetry is a combination of dissimilar images or discovery of occult resemblances in uh, things apparently unlike. And the famous thing he said, the most heterogeneous ideas. He bring, bring, and he does, John Dunn. He doesn't stick to one, like, you know, lane. He just keeps going here and there. Like in a religious uh, poem, you'll find like some sexual imagery and vice versa. It's like, and again, because of the geographical discoveries and his, his interest in some kind of sciences, he will include the references to the universe, to geography, to places. He was trying to change. For those people that was like, oh, why are you mixing this and that? Mixing, you know, genres was not allowed. So the most heterogeneous ideas are yoked by violence together. So you can bring heterogeneous different ideas together. But John Donne is overdoing it. He's bringing very unlike, unlikely things together. I don't think this is because he was doing this, but it's mainly because they were not used to such things. Nature and art are ransacked. I love this metaphor, how John Nunn, you know, ransacks nature and art together in a way that is unfamiliar to them. For illustrations, comparisons, and allusions. Alexander Pope says, listen, even those haters and losers, like Trump, uh, of, of, of John Donne, 
like they hated him, they didn't like to, you know. Uh, many of them admitted that John Donne was witty. That he was, he had unprecedented wit. Genius, they're here, Musiba. Not Alexander Pope. Not Alexander Pope. This is, by the way, I, this is a nice guy, Alexander Pope. You should read what he did to Shakespeare, what he said about Shakespeare. Very interesting guy. Sometimes he would change things in Shakespeare plays and say, ah, I think Shakespeare meant, to, it, meant it to be this way. That's very, very extreme. He said, Don had no imagination, but as much wit as I think any writer can possibly have. And his wit is ordinary. He's not unprecedented. He has no imagination. Ooh. Now, modernist poets, unsurprisingly, Samuel Johnson loved him. Because remember, the Romantics hated the neoclassicists. So everybody who hated the neoclassicists always went back to, uh, to whom? To John Donne. To tell the people, like, look, we're not doing this like other people did this. John Donne was the, the guide. Describe him as wonder, exciting, and vigor, intenseness, and peculiarity of thought, using at will the most boundless stores of capacious memory and exercised on subjects where, ha where we have no right to expect. Unexpected. He goes, you know, Shakespeare, the undiscovered uh, uh, territory from whose burn no, no traveler returns. John Donne goes there. This is the wit of John Donne. Now, Herbert, this is the guy responsible. We always attribute, uh, you know, the revival, the resurrection of John Donne to, to T.S. Eliot. It's true. But it was this guy, this amazing guy, Herbert uh, Grierson, who wrote a, po a book and collected the, most of the poems by John Donne and his followers in a book. Later, T.S. Eliot's review of the book made them what they became. He praised John Donne as reflective, the most thoughtful, imaginative, genius, unconventional. Look at the word, unconventional. T.S. Eliot described them in his article, a generation, and I love this statement, a, gener a generation most named than read. People name Donne, the metaphysicals, but they don't usually read them. And when they read them, they don't benefit from, from John Donne. T.S. Eliot believed that poetry has to be difficult. He believed that poets, to write great poetry, they have to imitate John Donne, to write like John Donne. And in the 20th century, ironically, John Donne comes back to life 300 years later. I don't like to say John Donne, T.S. Eliot discovered him or brought him to life. To life. Like he came to life himself. He resurrected himself like a phoenix. He found us. And I love one critic said, John Donne was writing 300 years ahead of his time. In the 20th century, he became one of the most significant poets. One of the most significant poets. One of the most uh, uh, quoted poets probably after Shakespeare. John Donne. Okay. This is a surprise. Or not. Virginia Woolf loved John Donne. And look at what she said about John Donne and his representation of women. Because again, you will find so many articles accusing John Donne of being uh, uh, an anti-feminist, even a, mis a misogynist. Somebody who hates women. She says, Donne's poems reveal a lady of a very different caste. She was brown, but she was also fair. She was solitary, but also sociable. She was rustic, yet also fond of city life. She was skeptical, yet devout emotional but reserved. In short, she was as various and complex as John Donne himself. Not only just inactive, absent, muted object of admiration. She's very colorful. She's complex. She's also various. And again, she believes that John Donne empowers women. And empowering women is one of the reasons why we still seek out John Donne. Why after 300 years, now 400 years, and more, we still hear the sound of his voice speaking across the ages so distinctly. No man is an island, John Donne says. One of the most beautifully said. You will be surprised how many people usually quote uh, uh, John Donne. The sun also rises by Ernest Hemingway, said to be... Uh, 
a quote from his poem, The Sun Rises. Uh, in, in his beautiful extract where he says, it's not poetry actually, it's prose, no man is an island. At the end he says, uh, I, I included a quote here, uh, don't, send, don't ask for whom the, toll bell, the, the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. You know, in the church, in the past, if somebody died, the, 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 the bells of the church will be tolling, will be ringing, just to, to, to say that somebody is dead. So he says, if you hear the bell, don't send to ask who's dead, who died. You, you died. Yeah, for, to whom the, the, the bell tolls, also from, from this great guy. Okay, ladies, question, please. That's a very interesting question. This is what we, do, what we say, what we mean by going back and trying to reread and dig. There could have been poets like Shakespeare, like, uh, like Dunn, <coughs> who were totally obliterated because they were forgotten. Nobody uh, recorded them, nobody wrote their poetry, nobody. And the question applies to women, by the way. Women, the first, when you studied, like the first uh, like, uh, woman, Probably the first poem by woman we studied previously was in the 17th century. Women must have written stuff before, but they were not taken seriously. Their moms, their dads, their brothers, their sisters might have made fun of them. So maybe there was somebody, but I, I'm not aware of anybody uh, uh, John Donne was imitating or following or taking as a role model. Maybe he is this genius who just said, I should be some, doing something differently. Please. I don't think actually anybody would and says I want to make a It's a process, yeah. Like it's his beliefs, he has different ideas, and so he writes according to those different ideas, and then later on people decide that he's a different school. But many people like to follow him. He had, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, not many be people, few people loved his poetry during his lifetime and, and later on. Women were great admirers. We, we usually forget this. And again, this says to Dryden, shut up. Because he assumes that women cannot understand. So when would we describe him, or like when we first started talking about Virginia Woolf as a person who hates women, if women really admired him? I think that he actually was... Okay, the only person who said John Donne hates women is Dryden. Somebody who hates John Donne. So don't take Dryden for granted talking about Donne. The subclass, yeah, yeah, that's uh, like he belonged to the subclass. He was yeah. marginalized on the fringe of society. He was, she, they were also there, but they found something in his poetry, something appealing to women, something empowering women, giving women voice. In John Donne's, if you if we go back here again, taking this as a love poem, not as a religious poem, because people like to take it as a religious poem. And, and say here Jesus is you know going you know going to, to, into the river and the sun being a pun playing on the son of God and and the sun here. Uh, the woman in the text is present and powerful and active, not here in other texts as well. Sometimes she's silent; she doesn't speak, but what she does is what the whole poem revolves around. The whole universe sometimes, okay. So, in, in, like we said this uh, before here, the woman uh, uh, is, not, uh, is not as naive, or I don't want to say naive, is not as passive or inactive as we saw in, in Marlowe. She's not taken for granted. Here, that, in my understanding, the very idea itself, the very idea of John Donne writing this different, taking the whole poem into a different scene instead of the pastoral nature and green, you know, um, grass and everything, taking it to this scene is new. And this idea in itself suggests that John Donne knows that the woman is going to understand this. He's going to understand the different, uh, the change in, in, in setting from, again, the idealism of, of, of the Elizabethan age to the realism of John Donne. Look at how he's, again, I, I, I pointed this out before. 
when he's talking about this, the, the scene where men are running after the, the woman, the, the fish, you know, going to be, uh, to, for the bait, being the woman. And look at this negativity here. Oh, darkness, I would say. The change of tone. He's realistic. He's not telling the woman, I have the perfect world. I'm drawing the perfect world. The, this world has, you know, beautiful things, but also dark things. When you talk about people freezing and legs injured. Look at this word. I don't think you'll find treacherously in anybody's uh, poem. Treacherously. You know? He says, it's unpoetic word. word. It, it's, it sounds unpoetic. But for John Donne, any, po any word can be there. And look at the strangling, you know, to strangle something, to strangle something, to hang somebody, to suffocate somebody's snare, or when do we knit? And then he says, look at, again, the slimy, like, this is not an, 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 an idyllic scene, this is not a romantic scene he's creating. Because he's suggesting that this is life, sometimes, sometimes good, sometimes bad. This is the, real, the reality of life. The bedded fish in banks outraced the tired men who couldn't get the, the woman or curious traitors sleeve even when they tried to, to deceive them, each other to get this, uh, this bait. You will read so many things about the last, uh, so many interpretations about the last. Uh, uh, this woman cannot be deceived or this woman does not deceive. Why, isn't he, why is he saying uh, the fish if he is enchanted by the woman, if he is in love with her, if he wants her, why is he saying that he is a fool? Because in another poem, by the, by the way, he says, I am, uh, I am a, does he say, I'm a triple fool, I know, or I'm a double fool, I know. He, say, he begins the poem saying, I'm a stupid person, I'm a fool. I'm a triple fool, I, I think he says, I am a triple fool, I know, for, uh, for writing poetry and for saying so, something, we'll see this. Uh, extract in a bit. So the, the fish that is not caught by the bait, by the woman, that manages to escape the woman, the magic of the woman, the beauty here, everything, is wiser than the speaker in the poem. So is he regretting, you know, falling in love? Is he saying? Uh, honestly, I'm not sure what he's, what he's saying. And, and this brings me to a, a, a very important point about John Donne. There are always layers in his, in his poems. There are always layers of meanings. You could take the, the poem here or there and this. Listen, this doesn't make him difficult. This makes him interesting. We take him home. He's not, we, like if you study other poets, usually you just, okay, think of the poem in the class. You're like, okay. But John Donne lives forever in our memories because you keep asking the question because he makes you curious. He makes you ask many questions. What if? What does he mean here exactly? Why is he doing this here? Why doesn't this? I read somebody saying this is ironic. Probably he means the opposite of this. Okay, we go back to being the complexity of John Donne again. Uh, I think, like, when I first read it, I was thinking about the bait itself. So when you're talking about a fish getting a bait or eating this bait, it means that this fish will get caught and maybe, like, well, it's, like it will die. So love so, is death, he's saying. Exactly. He's saying love is so death. He's giving everything he has just for this uh, lover. And then, like, if this lover goes or if this lover uh, vanishes from his life, he will be dead. He has nothing else to do. I don't know. Like, this is how... Th this could be one possible reading. Like, this relationship is his death. But why is he saying this? Because he's John Donne. Possibly. So I want you, for the sake of time, I want you to do more research into this. Again, this could be taken in a religious understanding. I don't like to go there. We focus on this being a parody, a love, a love poem. So I listed some features here. I, I did some kind of stretching of John Donne before we go to the last text. There is always I don't, say, I don't want to say always, there is parody and intertextuality. And when you parody somebody, you bring them down. You quarrel with them, you dispute with them, you fight with them. You try to offer the readers another possibility of another world view, a different world view. Telling the people, hey, this is not the only thing. Marlowe's world, there is something else. I think realism as opposed to Elizabethan idealism Dialogism, I like this, we'll talk about this later on in more detail. There is, he creates dialogues between him and the neoclassicists, between the traditions and the new ways of doing things, between 
him and the woman, between uh, the woman and him, etc. We will find a conceit, el elongated metaphor. The woman as a bait is a very strange, you know, uh, metaphor. This is the bait, the food you use to catch fish, and this is the woman. There is no resemblance whatsoever. When you go through the whole thing, it's like, hmm, maybe. This is called a conceit, where the relationship between the vehicle and the tenor, between the two things, could be far-fetched, unlikable, unlikely. Unlikely to happen in real life. And the, the second part of the conceit is that it's long. Goes through the whole poem sometimes. There is wit, there is argument. Uh, he mixes the devotional and the secular. If you want to, to read this poem as a love poem, but also as a religious poem, he mixes religion with uh, sensuality. Some people might describe the language, the words of, you know, slimy and strangled and treacherously and cut their legs as vulgar. If vulgar means colloquial language, okay. Again, we'll find more personal experiences like the romantics, more people in a different way than the collective idea of writing about the queen and the battles and the heroes and, and the society. And definitely, John Donne is, like uh, Virginia Woolf suggested, he's empowering women. He's showing us a woman that is not uh, simple-minded, uh, sim uh, uh, simple that is not naive, that is not inactive, but a woman who's powerful, a woman who is active, a woman who is intellectual, a woman who is the core of the whole poem, the whole text. Now, in, in the remaining... Uh, minutes, I want just to show you what he did to the, to the sonnet. <coughs> so if you count the lines here, look at this. How many lines do we have here? 14. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, that's 14 lines. This is a sonnet. Remember the sonnet? Yeah. We had Petrarch. and Shakespeare, the English sonnet, the Italian sonnet. Theme, love, theme, love, but also expanded to include many things, right? Structure, octave, and sestet, structure, three quatrains, one, Couplet, one rhyming couplet, rhyme scheme, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, C, D, C, D, other varieties are possible. With Shakespeare, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, and the rhyming couplet gets to G, G. The rhyme scheme here begins with V, which takes A, so B, it's not about the letters, it's about the sound. Throw, B, and me, A. And then going back to B, A, Flow and go, B, B. Now, delivery is also an A. Look at this. If you get to like, okay, A, B, A, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, then this is most probably uh, some kind of imperfect rhyme. Some people will do some stretching, will say maybe for poetic, like a poetic license, poetic reasons, you could just give it a little bit of a push, like delivery. Like me, something. Okay. Like? Or an imperfect rhyme. Thank you. I think I, I take it as an imperfect rhyme. And then here, men, we have C, D, D, and C. And then eternally is E. E, but again with an imperfect rhyme. Yeah, I heard people uh, like read this, internalize, so it rhymes with die. 
you know? But I also think this is an imperfect rhyme, eternally and die. Like, look at one sonnet. In Shakespeare, you could read 15 sonnets, 20 sonnets, and you don't find one, imp one imperfect rhyme. But with John Donne, you'll find a lot of them. Okay. Now we had something similar to this that, is, that wasn't that common. If we talk about Shakespeare and Petrarch being the most famous sonneteers, John Donne is not following Petrarch and he is not following Shakespeare. Okay. But the track, 12. 12 years. So it's mixing. 12 what? 12 lines. The sonnet? Have you been asleep in the past month? 14 lines. Sonnet, 14 lines. There's no way a sonnet can be 13 or... Okay. So, uh, many people would see this as closer to Petrarch than Shakespeare. That's, that's correct. But I like to take it as a mixture of both. He goes for Petrarch, and he always kind of insists on the couplet. Remember, like I said, Shakespeare made the sonnet famous in England, made the couplet something, wow, nobody can do. I think John Donne is saying, I can do the, the couplet thing. Kind of posing more challenge. But what's more, when you read the text, death be not proud. Oh my God. What, like what? Is he... Whose death? What is he talking about? Who is he talking to? His wife being likened to death? His mother-in-law? Definitely not. This is, if you look at this, this is a religious poem, a devotional sonnet. A poem a religious person writes. Look at this. He's taking the most sacred form of poetry, the sonnet, and almost changing everything about it. A theme a rhyme scheme and the structure. The structure could be a cup, uh, uh, an octave, uh, like, like what we did with uh, in Husserl to Han, a, a, an octave, a quatrain, and a couplet, or three uh, quatr quatrains, and then a couplet. Isn't this interesting? Imagine again the people who loved the sonnet and considered it nothing but pure love poem. How are they going to react to John Donne? Someone say, hey, I have a sonnet for you. Wow, really? Nice. Give it to me. And then, all the things, death be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful. And look at, remember, with, with Shakespeare, every line is basically one full sentence. Shall I compare thee to someone's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of me. Like, but with John Donne, he just keeps snaking. Death be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. You're not powerful. You're not dreadful death. And this is very, a very memorable thing to say. For those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me. We'll go through this in detail ne next time. I want you to just for the sake of comparison, to see other sonnets by John Donne. This is also a sonnet. Look at the beginning. When you read the, the, the sonnet, stay away from people because you don't want to get them to, mis to, mi to misunderstand you. Spit in my face, ye Jews. There's anti-Semitism here, but look at the opening here. Beheaded? We, 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 you know, we shifted from shall I compare thee to a summer's day to this, spit in my face, ye Jews. And then the, probably the most famous sonnet, batter my heart. Look at the openings. Death be not proud, spit in my face, batter my heart. And finally, look at these uh, 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 summaries here. We'll, we'll, I'll go through them and then stop. So I just want to repeat things I said in other words. We'll continue next class with, with John Donne. So the metaphysicals, inverted commas, 
a group of poets led by John Donne, and then we have Herbert later on, Andrew Marvel, and Henry Vaughan. Uh, Donne wrote poetry as other poets were. He wrote different poetry, were adopting the classical rules of the decorum. John Donne was a modernist. A modernist means somebody who writes against the current, against the mainstream rules of versification. The neoclassical critics did not like John Donne. They rejected him. They negatively framed him. They kicked him out of, and I think, I can't remember, I think, I think it was Samuel Johnson say, who said, John Donne is not a poet. I think this is the most extreme thing you could do. I think it's more extreme than saying he, uh, he deserves hanging. He's not a poet. And then, thanks to Grierson and T.S. Eliot, uh, many people started to admire and appreciate uh, John Donne. Uh, today, John Donne is one of the most significant uh, poets of all, of all times. Uh, next class, we'll see two uh, poems for John Donne, and then we'll move to another poet. If you have questions, please hang around. Dr. Kulafia.